Simple. As soon as we can when it's safe and appropriate. Less simple is not when, but how. Health authorities will need to provide clear answers on several important questions to help us answer the how. First, what testing is available to make certain an individual is not carrying the virus? Is that test current? And how are those who tested positive or negative being tracked? And finally, what's the risk of exposure to school and could that cause an individual to bring the virus home with them? In ordinary times, as many as a million people might be in our schools on any given day. Students and school staff in classrooms and families and visitors to school events like musical performances and football games. Those million people go home to a couple million more people. We closed schools before there was any known occurrence of the virus in schools to mitigate the spread of the disease and it seems to have made a difference. At the same time, we're all aware that in the long run, there's no economy without education. And in the short run, there's a much smaller economy without the childcare and safety net public schools provide to working families. This balance between the health risks and the need to reopen the economy is one which will need careful evaluation and an open public conversation in the many weeks ahead as health authorities provide all of us with more information. We'll continue to make the safety of all in our school community, students, staff, families, and visitors, a priority as we plan to reopen school facilities. The other important piece of our return to schools will be to help students recover from the missed learning opportunities. This will be critical for students who are most impacted by the absence from school, and, and in particular, those who might be less capable of working independently, our youngest learners, students with learning differences and disabilities, and English learners. We expect to place an increased effort on elementary students with more reading and math teachers at every grade level and additional support to help all students address the social and emotional issues this crisis may have caused. I spoke many months ago about our plans to do this in our highest needs schools. In light of the current situation, we need to extend that effort to all elementary school students. Call it a primary promise, if you will. A promise to make sure every child has a foundation in literacy, math skills, and critical thinking before they finish elementary school. We owe it to every child to provide them with the education they deserve. And the cost to children in society if we don't far outweighs the investment we need to make now. It may sound counterintuitive to be talking about increased spending in education in the midst of looming state budget issues, but it's necessary. Unless we're prepared to sacrifice a generation of boys and girls who are counting on a great education as a path out of poverty. We're far enough into this crisis we can begin to estimate the cost for our schools. At the outset, we said we're going to do the right thing for students and families and the right thing for our employees who serve students and families. That remains our objective. As the chart shows, we're expecting to incur almost $200 million in additional costs during the remainder of this school year because of the virus. It'll take some time as well as public and political support to make sure we're properly reimbursed by local, state, and federal government for these investments we're making in students and families. The portion of costs that's not budgeted includes $9 million for safety equipment and supplies. We've already exceeded the initial amount provided by the state and we'll spend more in the coming weeks to provide proper equipment for those involved in the relief efforts. $78 million providing meals to children and adults. In these extraordinary times, we'll continue to help all who are in need and in the absence of a broader food relief effort by the city or county, we've stepped up to help. $23 million to help address the digital divide. We're able to use bond funds for a portion of the investment in technology, but providing an internet connection to students who cannot afford one at home is also necessary if we're to serve all students. It should be the responsibility of other government agencies, the FCC at the federal level, or the Public Utility Commission at the state level to address this challenge. But in the absence of action by others, we'll address the issue and sort out the costs later. We'll invest $31 million in training for educators. As was true 50 years ago for the NASA engineers and scientists leading efforts to reach the moon, training and preparation will play a critical role in our efforts. It's worth noting other school districts chose to stop instruction for a period of weeks to train educators. We believe maintaining relationships with students and providing continuity of learning during this time is quite critical, in particular for our most vulnerable students. So we kept schools open and asked educators to work with students 
and participating in the training at the same time. If we'd simply shut down while the training occurred, it would have incurred costs about $100 million per week with no connection to students. We'll be making an additional $50 million investment in summer school. Study after study tells us breaks in school significantly impact student learning. We're planning a major effort this summer and we'll refine this early estimate as plans are made final. The Board of Education has been kept informed of these expenditures and are committed to making sure we help all students continue to learn and provide support to students and families most in need. All purchases have been made with every attempt to secure the best price possible given the circumstances. In normal times, the state of California would pass a budget by June 30th, which provides the foundation for Los Angeles Unified's budget for the school year which begins July 1st. About 90% of school funding is provided by the state and the remainder by the federal government. We expect the state will delay the passage of a complete budget until later in the year and will also delay the deadline for local control accountability plans school districts typically complete along with their budgets. It's important to note state law prescribes March 15th as the last date for school districts to make any significant changes to staffing in schools so we don't anticipate significant reductions in the coming school year. The Board of Los Angeles Unified will be meeting in the coming weeks to review these issues and make any final decisions about the budget for the coming school year as the state issues further guidance. We continue to make progress in providing every student with a device and already have a significant number of schools where 100% of the students are connected. In the few short weeks since we first shared this information, we've reduced the number of high school students who are not connected to their school community from more than 15,000 students to less than 3,000. Great progress, but we're continuing to work to reach every student we can. The gap continues to close in elementary schools as devices arrive. The population we serve is quite transient, so we may not reach every student who is in our schools on March 13th, but we'll continue to make the effort. To the best of our knowledge, Los Angeles Unified is the only large public school district which is sharing this level of information about both the challenge and the work to reach these goals. I've spoken before about the need to make sure students are engaged. In a traditional school setting, we measure attendance and look for more subtle forms of engagement. Is a student behaving appropriately within the school norms? Does she or he feel they're part of the school community? And most importantly, are they using different approaches and showing progress in their learning? We're in the early days in the transition to online education, and educators are still figuring out how to solve this puzzle. There are lots of pieces, and all will have to fit carefully together in the work to address the unique needs of each student. As the chart shows, we can measure how often students are online and for how long, whether they're engaged in discussions about their studies and if they're turning in assignments. And we can do this by grade or school level and for different types of students. But we're still exploring some of the more subtle things one can observe in a classroom. How are students feeling? Are they connected to their classmates and teachers? And are they growing as individuals and as students? Educators will continue to refine their thinking on this and we'll share more in the coming weeks as they do. Let's take a deeper look at two important areas. Another chapter in our continuing look into instructional practice and the work to engage families in their children's education. First, we'll hear from Alicia Morris, who teaches AP Computer Science at Mendez High School, and Jennifer Cortez and Cesar Castillo, who teach third and first grades at Brooklyn Span School. I visited their classrooms on March 13th as they were preparing for the closure of school facilities, and I wanted to check in and see how it's going. We'll also hear from two of our regional superintendents, Jose Huerta and Mike Romero, and their local leaders in Boyle Heights and Carson, Dr. Francis Baez and Dr. Adana Brown. Efforts during the past 18 months to restore schools and the communities we serve as the center of our work are bearing fruit as you hear from all of them. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all for a school district which serves almost 700,000 students over 710 square miles. We've been reducing the bureaucracy and putting resources and decision-making closer to schools and the communities we serve. An important part of this is to increase the voice of families in their schools. And you'll see evidence of this in recent town halls in Carson and Boyle Heights. Please enjoy the short videos. Just tell me, sort of week one versus week four, a little bit that what the transition was like. I started out wanting to have a Zoom every day for every period, and I did that for week one. 
quickly learned that that might not be sustainable. Yeah, that sounds like madness. Yeah, that would be. So then we did, uh, I, I pared it down to three, and then I think our school sort of transitioned into a, a two times a week if you wanted to do Zooms. And so that's where we are now. Are you finding the ability to engage students? I'm going to need to share my screen so I can show you. Because all I right, not let's see it. No, I'm all in. All right, here I come. Let's see if you can formalize this into like, a computer science concept, a math concept, like specifically, what are you noticing that's happening? See if you can maybe even hypothesize um, something. If you put your binary probability all the way up to one, it would always go to the right side, like the right little lane. That's oh, that's interesting. So then we can make an assumption that if you go zero, it'll go all the way to the, all the, all the, way to the left. Interesting. What else did you notice? So Austin, you provided that professional development that first week. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know when it was. Um, and I have to tell you, those two speakers were wonderful. One of, the, one of the things that was shared was that first slide of your PowerPoint should be an agenda. And I thought- Well, we're all visual learners, right? So that gives us a prompt and some structure. Okay. Right. So, the, so the good learning is the good learning and the good teaching. And it, even if it's virtual, all those things need to be in place. It's amazing to see you and your students making this much progress. But the holy grail for us is going to be engaging students in the learning, in the journey, and it's going to be different. Well, listen, thank you so much for sharing. I look forward to it. Uh, tell your students I said hello with the virtual donuts. I will. Good. And we'll check in in a few more weeks. I will see how much progress, you know, progress continues. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. First of all, most importantly, everybody safe and well and your family safe and well? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank goodness. Thank you for asking. Yes. yes. Yeah, good. I'm glad to hear. Uh, I enjoyed taking a look at where the progress you've made. I just thought it was worth checking in. It's been about a month. Um, it's going well. I mean, each time it's a new thing that we learn. Um, it's a new experience. We started off slow, just getting you know used to the application, how to use it, what buttons, and and each week we're getting more students on, and getting more into the lessons. So this week we did a lesson on uh, fractions in math from Schoology. Bring in. The McGraw Hill, so bringing in their textbook and and a little bit more each time. Also, where they're just relaxing, that they're not so stressed. We want to make sure that they're mentally okay as well. Get outside, hear the birds. Um, what do you see? The clouds, the trees. But we were learning about weather, so they made a tornado in a bottle. So all they needed was a plastic water bottle and some dish soap. And so um, they were able to, to show that to me also online and show each other during one of our Zoom calls. Uh, it sounds like your students are engaged. I mean, that, that's got to be a bigger challenge when you have eyes on, you're all physically present. There's so many more cues you can pick up on. Oh, definitely. Especially when we're in the class, we, we work off of, of them, you know, their expressions. Are they getting it? We're able to, to check in a little bit more. In particular, I'm, I'm Curious about that engaging students. I think that's one of our great challenges is going to be in this shift where we don't have that physical proximity. I'm going to start Zoom for um, physical education, and I also plan on doing that next week for, for uh, restorative justice. Uh, your feedback on that. I'd be interested because one of the things that we know uh, when we're all together, that social emotional support, you can see, you can sense a child in need. So you can, you can hear just how amazing our teachers are. And this is just an example. Uh, Ms. Cortez and Mr. Castillo represent our Brooklyn teachers so well, and, and really teachers everywhere. I appreciate everyone's commitment in these extraordinary times. I know you all have families of your own to care for as well as, uh, as Cesar said, your kids. So we appreciate that. We had over 700 people attend the virtual town hall meeting. Um, in addition to the mayor, um, who also gave uh, feedback that it allowed the connection between the community. And as I mentioned, the community needs to hear from us. They want to hear from us and to see that alignment of the city leadership with the district leadership is so important um, to have over 200 questions being asked um, in regards to graduation, culmination, devices. Um, parents really came out. So Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna widen the aperture and take, take us back 18 months ago or so when uh, you took on this challenge of putting the school and the community back in the middle, if you will. So getting us out of the center and this top-down driven monolith to a more authentic engagement locally. Tell us a little bit about that journey and 
we're 18 months in, I think you're starting to see some of the progress. Tell us a little bit about it. Because of our community of school structure, I think, I believe we are much more nimble in pivoting, making decisions, planning, acting faster. And um, it, is, it is certainly a personalized community, customized approach. So last night's town hall meeting, it felt like a community town hall. The mayor of Carson joined us and he, 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 he talked highly of the work that's been happening in our Carson schools. We improved customer service in all aspects with instruction, with operations, with student engagement, parent engagement. It's all there in the community now. They don't have to seek it out or look or call different numbers. Everything is sitting, all the services are right there in the neighborhood where they should be. We're servicing the needs of that community with experts in the field, just like my colleagues have been mentioning. They know the PD that has to take place. They understand the operational issues. They understand the parents and the community. So we're connected. We're really connected with this model, with that certain community. And it's, it's a great thing to see. Give us your thoughts on what it means for the ability to focus on instruction which is ultimately where we want to spend as much time as possible. We want our educators in schools focused on unique needs of students and helping them learn. Going through the Schoology professional development, over 80% of our teachers have gone through that. So it's helped us to really hone in on which teacher either needs more support, which student needs more support, which parent needs additional support, for community members to come forward and say, we have this resource for students in the community. And because of that streamlined approach, it's help it, helping us to really enter the classroom, but without being in the classroom. If this current reality is starting to appear normal, it's okay to remind yourself that it's not. It's not normal to be distant from others. It's not normal to have your life turned upside down and be uncertain where your next meal will come from. And it's not normal for our school community not to be in schools. But we keep trying our best to help students learn and support students and families in need. And we can all look forward to our safe return to schools. Thank you for your continued patience and support.